rock and roll. So bunches. bunches. So I'm gonna put this okay. in the answer. I don't miss anything. So here you go. It's in the answer and you're frozen. Is it important for a sex addict to analyze their fantasies and arousal template? So Tammy, I didn't hear any of that. Is it important? I put it in answered. No, no, I, I got blocked out. That's I put the question in the answered question so you can read it. But you are, yeah, your internet is apparently. So of course we're having tech problems. Of course we are. Um, at my router, just be a minute. Tammy, entertain the troops. Please okay, entertain the I'm troops. Gonna, I'm going to go to one that I can answer. Spouse of an addict. You mentioned in prior Q&As that spouses crave detail and formal disclosure, but some details are best left unsaid. Given years of suspicions and gaslighting, I feel strongly that I must know the extent of my husband's acting out, who, where, when, and how many times in the what, sexual intercourse versus oral sex versus other, et cetera. I'm beginning to work with a support therapist myself, but can you please clarify what level of detail is and is not appropriate for a spouse to expect in a formal therapeutic disclosure? This one I can answer because we answer this all the time and I talk to lots of people. You, you can want all of that information and then it's going to be forever in your head and you don't deserve that. I, don't, I think you deserve to know what happened. Um, but as Dr. Rob has shared often, a good therapeutic disclosure with qualified people, uh, qualified professionals supporting both of you, the, the addict's going to have a page and a half, two pages. It's going to feel um, mechanical because it's going to it's going to be, you know, I had unprotected sex X amount of times. You know, I spent this much money. It's that type of uh, detail, um, but not. And I deserve, I think you deserve to know if it was your sister-in-law, your best friend, like if there's somebody that you're going to be bumping into all the time, you know, that's the kind of, if it happened in your house, there are some details that you absolutely do need to know. Um, but, but as far as like all the gory details and listening to, I don't even know, 20 pages of a narrative, you, you know, that, that is, you know, it was bad, you know, the, the addict has lied and things you, you deserve to have, um, uh, information and details where you knew you were, you know, you knew you were right and you were being lied to, but to have all of that, I mean, you get to pick, but my experience, which is now more vast is the, um, the partners that have that have a deeper trauma level to dig out of. So, you know, everybody gets to pick Dr. Rob, Dr. Rob does a peer consultation group every Tuesday with professionals. Do you know what the topic is that they talk about the most? or we talk about disclosure, because even with a, with professionals who are trained, you are each individuals and there's a process in each of you being prepared to do, you know, a good therapeutic disclosure, et cetera. Um, but my experience is that the partners that get all of that detail, it's, it, it is so much, you know, and it's so, it's so hard to dig out of. So um, while you know, you've been gaslighted, while you know that it's, it's really bad, you know, do, do you really need to know what position he used or what? I mean, like, honestly, do you want that visual stuck in your head forever? Once it's in there, it never goes away. You can do some trauma work and lessen the impact of it, but you will always, it will always be there. And I, I would feel sad for you for that, but you, you know, you get to pick. The purpose of a disclosure is to build a foundation of recovery on which to build. This to me leaves it a bigger gap for you to navigate. So that's, and on this one, I know Dr. Rob would agree, but I can read it to you later. But so, so here's, the, so can you go to answered? Oh, hi. Hi, I can see you now. Okay. So is it important for a sex addict to analyze their fantasies and arousal template? Um, I think that if somebody is in the stage of their recovery where they're working once you've worked past the initial part of acting out and you've gotten sober and you know your life is stable in terms of acting out then I think it's worth a look you know it depends I'm not sure what the person's asking like if they're into fetishes or into unusual arousal behavior that's probably something you should talk about and look at in the beginning but if they want to explore why they have certain fantasies or what's that about or what turns them on I wouldn't do any of that stuff until they got some time under their belt because you don't want to get, even just going to therapy and talking about things like that can be very triggering. And then you end up leaving therapy. And so I think a solid layer foundation of support and recovery 
look at whatever you want to look at, follow your therapist. So I put a second one in the answered and it's about disclosure. So I answered it, um, but you oh. can, you can, uh -oh. that, that was the one I answered because this I talk about all the time. So, um, uh oh, it's no, the no, Tammy no. and Rob. Okay. And I didn't hear your answer. So that's like, Ooh, okay. Uh, no, they full extent, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, um, I'm sure I gave the exact answer, shame answer that you're going to give, which is two things. Number one, I have worked with betrayed spouses for 25 years. And I will tell you, one of the main features I see you guys struggle with is that you have a feeling or a thought that if you have more information, that somehow it's going to get better. Or if you just learn this, then that's going to be the key. And you're not alone. Every spouse I've ever met wants that. The problem is, is that it's not going to make you feel better. It feels like it will, but it's actually going to make you feel more scared, more worried. And guess what? You're going to have more questions. And so reassuring yourself with answers to questions other than doing a formal disclosure and hearing everything, you know, I don't think that's particularly helpful. And as to the other piece, um, you know, I would not share graphic information with my spouse. I do not want to be having sex with my spouse and having them thinking, oh, he was doing this with that person. And you're picturing. So we give the information you need to have where, when, what, how, what it costs. But the actual detail of the sexual act, what this person looked like, or not going to talk about that because it's torture for you. It'll keep you on an endless cycle of pain. And it really doesn't benefit the relationship as much as you might feel it will. Was that like your answer? Yes, you went to you, the first part, you shared a, a different lens, but I went to the you don't need all those details stuck in your head forever where you're always thinking about he did that position with this person. And yeah, you're like, yeah, it's just further traumatizing for partners. So and then there's oh, their boobs are bigger than mine and my yes. you know, comparing yourself all that crap you don't need. Yes, yes. I, I can't tell you how many and this is just from a woman's perspective, have gone and gotten plastic surgery to look more like the ideal that they think they need to be. And, you know, so, and then later regret it, you know, for a number of reasons, you know, so it's all, it's all fine. I told, I said to this person, you get, you ultimately get to pick that would not be what I wish for you. So, okay. The next one, hello, how should I respond to if my spouse is sober for eight months and continues golfing and socializing with men he acted out with, went to strip clubs and prostitutes with? Well, I would change the locks. That's what I would do. I would be shocked I am shocked at your husband is a husband's lack of empathy, lack of understanding of how this might affect you and lack of insight into the fact that this is the very same situations that led to what he was doing. So I think you as a partner have every right to say, you know what, I don't feel comfortable with you doing that. And it could be a long time before I do. And I need you to respect that. If somebody went well, also, I want to say to you that if this, these people were aware that your husband was seeing sex workers or going to strip clubs and they didn't say anything. They just let it go on or they went with him. I'm not sure. I mean, these aren't relationships he should be having. And I think he can find new people to play golf with. And uh, so I just, I think the focus on you in the first, the focus on the first year is how can I accommodate you to make you feel better and safer? And so if I'm doing things that make you feel less safe and not any better, then I'm probably doing the wrong thing. And hanging on to, what do we call lower companions? you know, a lot of drug addicts want to hang out with the friends they made when they were using and they were really good friends and they spent a lot of time together, unfortunately used together. And that's where they're going to end up again. So they choose not to. Um, and that's a choice based on recovery and recovery is not always easy. I sometimes have to say goodbye to people and things that I thought were always going to be in my life. Do I want to get well or do I want to have what I want? So Tammy, do you want to throw anything in there to that one? I was, there are people in recovery that golf you you can go golfing you can go do activities with recovery people that's a safe environment to go do those things with yeah th this is i like i i honestly question if he's sober for eight months because if he's doing this kind of thing then to me th there's probably not a whole lot of recovery work because if he was talking to his sponsor and going you know I, my I'm wife wondering, said this y yes and i'm wondering if i should go um golfing with the guys i used to go to the strip clubs and see prostitutes with right. the sponsor would say no so so to me there's not a whole lot of recovery going on so i also Sorry. wrote a book for this guy called out of the doghouse a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating and i wrote it for men like this who don't have a clue or really are insensitive to the amount of pain they cost a partner and most 
women buy out of the doghouse. They read it and then they throw it at their spouses saying, you read this. So, it's a paperback, um, so it's not injurious. So yes, thank you very much. Okay, so the next question, spouse of an addict, after my latest discovery, I'm so sorry, I hate that when there's latest, and disclosure, I was diagnosed with HPV. How do my husband and I move forward with this, with physical intimacy? Well, um, for one thing, I really hope that you get a lot of medical care and are really attentive to yourself. Women get cervical cancer from HPV. Men get an annoying wart or two, although we can get anal cancer if we have HPV there, but um, this is a very serious thing. And this is not like giving you syphilis or this is more like herpes. You're gonna live with this the rest of your life. Um, if you're a woman, it may complicate birth. I mean, there are all kinds of issues. So the first thing I would do is be freaking furious. And I'm not sure that sexual intimacy would be on my mind. Now, I don't know how long these folks have been working on this. Um, by the way, how do you deal with your sexual needs? Buy a vibrator. <laughs> take care of yourself. You get to enjoy yourself sexually. If you wish to, it has nothing to do with him or her. Um, yeah. Tammy, do you have thoughts? I was like, why would you want to like, and it says latest discovery. So this means there's a whole pattern of this. This is not like one time and gosh, we're really working on it. You know, he's, I'm using he and she, and I, so just for clarification sake, but uh, sex Doesn't addiction matter. crosses all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to me, you, this would be uh, I've had multiple discoveries until there was some, some measure of safety. safety where I, you know, like the person that was still going out golfing with the, you know, with the uh, prostitute buddies, it's like, you know, wh what is this person doing actions that you can see that they're moving forward in recovery so that this isn't another pattern where you're going to be, you know, back at the doctor with more medical issues. So, and, and also, I guess I want to say to you guys, this is what seeking integrity is about. I don't usually push out our 12, our treatment program, but I will say that both of these men seem to both the golf guy and this one seem clueless about the pain and harm they've caused. And, you know, if you don't have empathy for your partner, you're going to do it again. If you don't feel part of what, so part of what treatment is, it's about confronting denial. And a big part of my denial is I can do this and it won't hurt you. You know, as long as you don't know, as long as you don't find out. And then when, of course, partners are hurt every single day, because we're non-intimate, we're distant, we give you, you know, stuff happens. So, um, so I, I'm with you, Tammy. I think that these are the kinds of cases that really need a little bit more support. And the reason I say that is because I think they're legitimate questions that the spouse is asking, but they're kind of asking them like incredulous. I mean, to me, they're it's like, what are you kidding me? Of course they should be doing that. But they're politely asking them like, you know, it makes me feel bad for them and wanting them to have their power back. And we have betrayed partner support groups, our drop-in groups on this website, sexandrelationshiphealing.com. I strongly encourage you, um, the, the partners will rally around you and help you um, re refocus your lens. How's that? So, okay, next question. Why do sex addicts shame spiral all the time, even when talking about something other than their addictions. Anytime I need to follow up with him with something he has been lagging on, really anything at all, he seems to get defensive, turn it around, pout, blame me, etc. Any normal discussion with another healthy person when it comes, when this convo is had with an addict, it becomes difficult to help. Okay, I just wrote an answer. Uh, I have to Whoops, I wrote an answer to the group. <laughs> I just wanted to type the word. The word is narcissism. Narcissism, first of all, all addicts are narcissistic when they're acting out because our focus is what we want, when we want it, and we're not thinking about anyone else. We don't have empathy for you because we're only interested in what we want to do. But beyond that, um, narcissistic people tend to need to be right, tend to get angry when challenged, tend to... Um, avoid criticism, tend to externalize and put it back on you. So the behaviors that you're talking about are really not related to sex addiction. They're more related to who this person is and, you know, what's underneath a lot of this hiding they've been doing. So, you know, I, I think, I mean, again, this is a therapy issue, a treatment issue. I mean, this man hurts you. By the way, we don't all shame spiral, but I'll tell you what shame is. And I love this thought about it. Um, shame is selfish. Shame is selfish because it's poor me and I'm a bad person. And why are you criticizing me and me, 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 me? But that's not the same as empathy or compassion. And to me, you know, I can say I ruined my partner's life. I feel so awful about it. I hate myself. That doesn't help my partner. 
If I say, I can't imagine what he or she is going through and how can I support them in their pain, that's empathy. So what you're talking about is a man who's very selfish, who's very stuck in his selfishness. And it could be a therapy issue. It's probably a therapy issue, but it also could be, uh, I mean, this is a therapy issue. That's really the, he's not, personalities don't change without a lot of work. And I'm sorry. So the next question is, um, oops. Oh, prostitutes with, I missed one. So prostitutes with, I am triggered by this and don't feel safe. It is, is it an appropriate boundary to say he needs to not be with friends with, with the men he cheated on me with? They socially went together to cheat on their wives. My husband is an essay and goes to five, six meetings a week and has a set, but he has no empathy. Well, this is the same. It must be must be disturbed addicts night <laughs> because this, we're seeing this, this is a this is the second part to the previous one with the you know the hanging out with i think yeah yeah i mean your safety is your safety and nobody gets to say what makes you feel safe or not and if i have hurt you and i am no longer equal to you and i have let you down that it is my job to show up to make you feel better I would never think of asking, I mean, even in early recovery, I would never think of asking my partner to put up with my hanging out with people I acted out with. I, I just think that's not only unempathic, it's cruel because you're sitting at home thinking, is he at it again? Is he doing it again? You know, it's just, and this is a continuation of questions about from partners, do I have the right to be so, do I have the right to expect this? Do I have the right to ask this? You bet you do. All bets are off if I violate our trust. And if in order for you to regain trust, you have to be able to say, I don't feel comfortable with you doing that. And I don't feel comfortable with you doing that. And I need to listen. I've had men quit jobs because they were so involved with different people at work and their spouse felt, felt so uncomfortable about it that they had to leave that job. And they did because their marriage and their relationship was more important to them than getting a raise. And so I think that we have to be completely willing. Now, you want to hit me? Not okay. You know, you want to do abusive things to me? Not okay. But within reason, you know, I really owe you one. And I'm going to manage to deal with your anger and tolerate it and also be accommodating because that's the only way out. And I hate these guys who are bullying these women. Like it really sounds like oh, someone's laughing out loud. Why are they laughing out loud? It's oh, it's a serpatic night. Yeah. Well, it's really vulnerable spouses night, you know, who want to have a voice, but the addict is not giving them a voice. And ahead, so Tim. I, I love 12 step. I really do. But here's what I'm reading. And I'm, you know, I don't know any of this, but I'm reading, I'm going to five to six meetings a week and I have a CSAT. What more do you want? But I, but I don't hear any changes. I'm still hanging out with the, it's like Dr. Rob said, I'm still hanging out with my bar friends. I'm still doing the same things that I did before going to a bunch of meetings, you can warm the seat, you know, you can check the boxes. We've had, I call them Mr. Recoveries at our treatment program. Yes. Where they are checking off all the boxes and are, you know, big people in the treatment world in their area. And they like that and they're lying to everyone in themselves. And so, so just checking off the boxes doesn't cut it. What his actions show, that's, that's when you know that he's actually getting recovery. And how do you know he's going to five or six meetings a week would be my question. How do you really know that? And what's going on? See, if it were me, I would call that CSAT and I would leave a message because you don't need a release to talk to a therapist. And I would tell my spouse, I'm going to call your therapist and tell him I'm really concerned about this and you're not listening to me and I'm, I feel like it's out of control. This isn't traditional therapy where there's intense private. I mean, this is about the coupleship. This is about them saving your relationship. And if you need to say, I don't feel safe with this and my spouse is not listening, I give you permission to call that therapist because I don't know, like Tammy said, this may, I don't even know if this person is checking the boxes, but how could they hear the pain and the struggle without identifying it and want to fix it? Um, by the way, I, well, anyway, we won't continue with that person. Okay, so the next question, have there been any recent studies showing improvement in sex addicts with ADHD who have been treated properly with medication? Yes, Dr. Rob did a podcast with Dr. Todd Love. I've got Todd Love and Troy Love, and I have to think. So Dr. <clears throat> Todd Love and Dr. Todd Love also did a, a webinar um, on 
a Super Saturday Recovery Summit. So he he is very well versed on all of this. If you email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com and ask for me for the links, I'll send you that information. But, you know, it, it like it was, I almost fell out of my chair when he was talking about how important it is to properly treat ADHD. Um, so I would invite you to reach out to me for that. Any other? And I just want to say one, I'm sorry, Tammy. No, go you? ahead. I, I just for those of you who aren't familiar, we we have some research on co-occurring mental health issues with with behavioral addictions, in particular sexual behavior. And we do know that about 20% of sex addicts are also have ADD or ADHD. So because um, we're impulsive and we're not thinking and we just make decisions and so, and then we end up lying about. So anyway, I, I, it doesn't guarantee recovery. Nobody's going to go on meds and get but what medication for the ADD person does is it gives them a moment to think, do I want to do this? Is this a good idea? That precious moment to think rather than just acting. And so the, the meds are very helpful, but they don't fix the person. Was that the answer? Did I answer the, answer the question properly, Tim? You did. Well, we so, both did. We're a team. Yes. Yes. So next okay. question, when I go into public, I'm constantly aware of the women around me and I want, all I want to do is check them out. It takes a lot of energy to focus on something else. This is painful for my wife. It makes her feel undesirable, small, and doesn't want me to go in public with her for that reason. What can I do practice to reduce how distracting this is for me? And what's a healthy way to approach this with my wife? Well, the healthy way to approach it with your wife is to not do it because your wife doesn't want to discuss it or deal with it. She just wants it to go away. And she wants to be as she should be when you're sitting and eating dinner, the focus of your attention. Now, I, I will, we have something in the 12-step programs and I use it in treatment. We call it the three-second rule. So let me go back and say this. Addicts are not very good at not doing things. We're much better at doing things. So you're kind of saying, I'm not going to look at that person. I'm not going to, that's not going to work real well. But if you say what I'm going to do when I find someone attractive, and these are the three, this is what we do. It's a three-step process. The first thing you do, and this will not be hard on your wife, because this is just normal. You'd look over and see someone attractive. And the second moment, you look away. You don't stare. You don't go back. You don't. And the third second, you, you validate that person's humanity. You, you think of them as someone's daughter or sister or mother or whatever it is. So there is a moment because we're all human. Oh, that person's attractive. And then we look away. Um, it indulging that, and that's what it is, by the way, indulging those moments um, is not only, it will not only be unfair to our partner who feels violated right in front of us, but it also revs us up. Ooh, because I know what speed is sex. I know what it is to be a sex addict. It's, oh, I, I like that. I want some of that. Well, if I can't get it there, maybe I get it somewhere else. And so it gets the brain going in the wrong direction. Um, by the way, there's nothing wrong with saying to your partner during dinner, I've been finding myself looking at other women and I'm so sorry, I don't mean for that to offend you. And I'm really gonna work on my three second role um, because I think oftentimes things go unsaid or the partner is just the angry one and I, because they're being violated in the moment. And I think for us to say, hey, wait a minute, I noticed you noticed, like be real. I noticed you noticed me looking at that person and I completely understand what you're feeling. And you know, it's something that you not only need to deal with internally but you also need to let your spouse know that you're aware that this hurts them and you're working to not do it. And I think it's really important, like you just said, to focus on what we can do. So the three second rule, but I think it's also, I'm, you know, I'm going to, with intention, I'm going to be going out with my partner. I'm going to pay attention to my partner. I'm going to hold my partner's hand. I'm going to make sure that my focus is directed to my partner rather than, oh my gosh, I just can't be looking around and doing all that. You know, it's going to be like, it's like, it's almost like you're setting yourself up for this whole disaster because I'm going to see other people. It's going to bother my partner, all of these things. And it isn't, um, so then it's, trying not to do rather than here's what I can do. So, you know, I think that that can be empowering and, you know, and even bookending it, I'm going out, I'm calling my sponsor. I'm going out with my spouse. I want to, I, I want to have some boundaries. I'm going to accountability to my spouse. I'm going to do this. And then when I get back, I'm going to call you and I'm going to tell you how I did and what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. So, so. You know, uh, Tammy, something I used to do early in recovery when I didn't know how to do anything more is I would see some attractive, I'd just look down. Because the only reason to look is to try to get something going either in my head or with that person. And I have no reason to do that. So I might as well just look down. And by the way, the looking down reminds me of the shame 
that I feel when I'm hurting myself and others. So uh, it's kind of humanizing. If you can't do the three seconds, just look at the floor because you're better off than staring at that person. And by the way, what do you think it's like for that person to be stared at? You know, I, I had, um, yeah. So I had in group at Seeking Integrity, I was running group not that long ago. And, um, and I've lost a bunch of weight. I've lost like 25 pounds. So I had to buy some new clothes. And I bought clothes that fit. They weren't extremely tight, but they fit. And I went into work and one of the clients said to me something like, uh, they were triggered because I was wearing these really tight pants and they wish that they didn't have to look at that or something like that. And I felt terrible. Like I had done something wrong for wearing clothing that was not, you know, but this person got triggered and what do they do? They blame me. So um, I think, um, uh, what do I want to say about that? So, and so by being looked at in that way for the, you know, one of the few times that I had it coming from the other side, it made me feel ashamed. I felt like I'd done something wrong. Why is this person, or did I encourage that? Did I do so? so also you might think about the person you're staring at and how your behavior might affect them. Um, you don't know if they have abuse and people used to, you know, you don't know if someone walked down the street and hurt them and they stare, you don't know their history. And so, yeah, humanizing them and look down. <laughs> okay. So next question. Um, I put this one in the answer too. Do you know how many sex love addicts who were also compulsive gamblers? Is it not uncommon for this pairing? Um, well, this is a tough one. Um, so one of the, I'm going to mention again, we run a treatment program called Seeking Integrity. And the reason that uh, we created it is because of this issue of co-occurring addictions. We have people who are just sex addicts. We also have people who struggle with drugs and sex. It's not unusual for people to struggle with food and sex, gambling and sex. They're intensity seekers. They're looking to escape through, oh, let me see the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And that's not a good thing. So um, it, wait, it makes sense. For some of us, addiction is like a game of whack-a-mole. You know, I put push it down in this area. I've worked with lots of guys who they got sober and gained 40 pounds, you know? So, uh, and Tammy, I want to ask you about this, to this question. Do you think it would be helpful for someone to go to Gamblers Anonymous and the sex? I mean, how would you suggest they do this in 12-step to try to get better? Would they go to both programs? Would they see different therapists? I mean, how do you think that would work? I, I've had this conversation with people. There are there were some 12 step programs that I'd never heard of before, but I thought, man, I could spend all my time in 12 step meetings. Like if, if I picked everything that could possibly be problematic for me with my compulsive behavior, I could be in 12 step meetings all the time for different things. So, so I do think, you know, we do a fantastic job at our program addressing co-occurring and we talk about food. We talk about gaming. Gaming is huge. Gaming and gambling. Gaming you know, and porn. I, yeah, yeah. A lot of the guys that come to our program, you know, when I'm asking them questions and stuff, I say, you know, and we don't want it to switch to, you know, gaming or something. I hear this all the time. Well, I'm not doing that, but, you know, so I, I need something. So I'm doing this other thing and it's just as compulsive and it's taking you away from all your relationships just as much. So, so I, you know, for me, I had to address the primary thing, the thing that was going to kill me the most. And, but then yeah, I've been honest on this before, you know, I, I started out with alcohol and drugs and then I, you know, I realized I had an eating disorder and I had to, and that the shame around that one for me, you know, having to, to own, cause I should have known better. That was part of it. And, you know, and, and telling my poor dad, you know, he was like, I don't even know what that means. And I had to explain it that, you know, oh, it was awful, but anyway, but I haven't had I have worked my recovery on all aspects. I just wrote in one of the Facebook groups I'm on for recovery because they're talking about, well, I'm, if I'm, I'm using this instead of that and all this. And I said, you know, I'm happy, joyous and free because I've addressed all of the stuff. You know, I, I, I can't live numbing out on something and be happy, joyous and free. I want to be connected with people. So, so to me, you know, if you just go, well, now I'm spending seven hours gambling or gaming or whatever you know you're still not enjoying people well as we say you know the addictions are the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot underneath and so as long as this person is bouncing back and forth between these issues they're not going to get to what's driving it by the way it may well be that a psychiatrist would be useful this person could have ocd they could have anxiety they could have so much depression that they have to reach for something um, i had a family member i never told you this time i had a fa close family member whose husband was a gambler 
And, you know, first time she found out, it's like, okay, we'll go to therapy, work on it. But the second time she found out, no more credit cards, no more checks, delete all of the uh, accounts and your Amazon. You don't get to, in other words, she took charge of the finances and she, she wasn't taking over his life. She was protecting herself. And I think that you have a right to say, I'm handling the finances and you don't get to touch a penny unless you ask me for it because you have a problem and I'm not going to suffer as a result. And by the way, I hope you're not having sex with this person because it's, you could just, if he's gambling, then you can get HPV too. So I, I'm a little concerned that you're the one asking this question. You know, where is your spouse? I would be like Tammy said, oh my God, two issues at once. What am I going to do? I'd be running to every corner to try to get better. Um, and by the way, Gamblers Honest is a great program. Did you know, Tammy, let me just say this, that um, one of the hardest, if Nina, as, as difficult as sex is gambling. It is so enticing and the person's head goes into fantasy and it's all about the rewards that come when you don't know they're gonna come. So I got, I won, okay, I can't wait till the next time I win. And that's what they're betting on is that you will keep going because you have this idea of what you're gonna have the next time. And when I'm looking at porn, I'm thinking about, oh, well, the next image and the next image. And it's the same kind of the next card, the next card. It's all about dopamine, by the way, which is longing and anticipation. That's what the hormone releases feelings of. So uh, this is a multi-pronged problem, accountability, multiple issues, maybe some mental health stuff, but, and, and protection protecting yourself as a spouse. Maybe you need to see a lawyer and separate your finances. Maybe do that now. I have talked to a lot of you spouses that there's nothing wrong with a trial separation. It doesn't mean you're going to get divorced. It doesn't, but maybe it's hard to set boundaries with someone in the house or when your finances are shared or, and maybe you feel like you're threatening to leave, but then you don't really want to. And you might do something legally to protect yourself. And boy, does that give a message to the addict? Like I'm going to be out of here, you know, even if that isn't your intention. So what it's about is self-care. Um, Anything else, Tam? Oh, well, we talked about. It. Oh, there's a lot on. I mean, that. I mean, there's so much when you're talking about, you know, cross addictions, multiple addictions, and you know, it, 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 just switching to another one. You know, you you don't get the benefit of recovery. You're not really in recovery, and you're more likely, I think, to relapse to the other one because it's still the primary. So, okay. Well, and one more thing: what do people mm -hmm. do in casinos other than gamble? They drink. Drink. Yeah. And they look at attractive people who are walking by half naked because that's what a casino <laughs> keeps you in there. So how likely would it be? I'm going to have a drink. Oh, that person's hot. I'm going to go up to, the, you know, th this is going to undermine both pieces. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'll stop. Okay. So the next question, at what point in a sex addiction cycle does the addict experience their high? All the way through. Um, the first minute I think about, oh, that would be fun the neurochemistry starting. And then when I, and all the fantasies about what I could do and what I, it starts with fantasy. So fantasy ups my, uh, the release of my um, adrenaline and endorphins. I start to get excited just with the fantasy. And then the fantasy leads to setting up behaviors, getting money out of the bank, changing my clothes, lying to you, and then eventually the acting out. But I think the whole cycle is about getting high on our own neurochemistry, you know, um, I, it's a long story. I don't want to tell the story, but, um, but when there's a shock to the system, an emotional shock to the system, people want to run, these folks want to run away. And um, anyway, I'm going to let you jump in there, Tammy. No, I, I think, I think that that is, is absolutely accurate. It's the entire thing for the planning, the experiencing, the fantasizing about it afterwards, a lull till you start all over again. So, you know, some people are really quick cycles. Some people are a longer one, you know, periods in between, or some of them and are what, using other things. So. And what we're talking about folks is how you get from point A to point B, because there is something that we teach about the whole cycle of addiction, because it is a cycle. And the reason it's a cycle, because the reason it's a cycle is because there's no way out. The way you deal with your stressors, your anxiety, even the good things, any feelings is to run into the behavior. And then you're going to have feelings by doing the behavior, shame, discomfort, you know, you're lying and feeling uncomfortable and shameful leads to the behavior. So it is, it's a cycle that people, that's why we do treatment. That's why there are CSATs. That's, we have to interrupt this cycle um, at any point really and teach people how to move on from it. Okay. So the next question is, um, Dr. Rob, uh, hi, Dr. Rob, if you could kindly explain sex addiction, why do Patrick Carnes put sex offenders such as pedophiles or rapists in the same category? Thanks. 
Well, I'm not sure that that's true. I don't think Dr. Carnes would. I think in Out of the Shadows, he describes different levels of addiction and he talks about offending in the highest level. And what we believe is that many sex offenders are compulsive in their behavior and many of them do go to strip clubs and porn and sex workers and they offend. So there is a category of offenders who are compulsive, if you will. But I think when that was first written, I think and I don't think it's been changed since. I do think that uh, we have a little bit different thinking. Like I don't see many offenders in, in a, you know, 800 people. I may have seen very few. And the ones I've seen are usually offending online, not necessarily in real time. So to be honest with you, we draw a pretty strong distinction. I mean, Tammy and I, we would not accept someone to treatment who had a hands-on offense in their adult life. Um, so, you know, for me to treat them, they'd have to be compulsive. It would have to be part of a larger picture, not just one behavior. And, um, and they probably, uh, and they have to be aware that when they're going to face the music, we have worked, they're going to get confronted, they're going to get challenged. We don't treat, uh, I don't treat offenders in the same way that I treat addicts. I have a much heavier hand because I understand that there's victimization involved. But no, I don't believe that all offenders are sex addicts and I don't, certainly don't think. In fact, I would say very few sex addicts are actually offenders. If, let me say one more thing, offending is an aggressive kind of behavior. I'm going to use you. I'm going to, you know, and sex addicts are, uh, we're not, you know, when you get angry at us, we go act out. We don't, you know, when we get upset, we go somewhere else. So the, while the planning of the perpetration is similar, that kind of behavior is really specific to the person and their experiences, not to all sex addicts. Okay. So the next question, a sex addict here, I've recently been exiled from my partner and I's bedroom because I lied about my slips and rightly so. My question, I was wondering if it was appropriate to set a time frame to revisit moving back in. I'm afraid that without some sort of expected time frame, I will push my partner's boundaries and I don't want to do that. I also, um, and also get rid of uncertainty and reduce some of the anxiety so that I can focus on doing the right things. Are there any framework you might suggest for this type of thing? Well, what we don't know is how long this person's been working on this. And so, you know, a time frame. first of all, you don't, I would not set the time. This is a, yeah, you're a sex addict. I wouldn't set the time. I think it's something that your partner needs to set, or it's in discussion with your partner, or it's a therapy issue. I'm not, I'm not sure about you're doing any of this on your own. And I will push my partner's boundaries and also get her, oh, I see. So you want to have this time frame. I, I understand, but I don't think you can because trust is renewed on a daily basis. And your partner needs to see a period of time, probably 60, 90 days at least, if you've been in the process for a long time. Like if you've been at this for a few years and you've had a slip, depending on the slip, um, and you lied about it. I wouldn't want you in my room for three to six months. And I would say to you, you don't get to pick the win. That's up to you as a couple or that other person. I don't think you threw yourself out of the bedroom. <laughs> I think somebody threw you out. So maybe they should decide when you get back in. And the well, lying. And I, well, I was to say, and I don't think it's a time, like a magical number of days and you cross it off the list and ta-da, I'm back. It's what it's the actions, just like Dr. Rob was just saying, is you you need to show that you're trustworthy on a day-to-day -day basis. And and so having these are the, you know, read out of the doghouse, but having the trust being rebuilt, having your actions match what your lips are saying, you know, that's what's key. And you know, so it can be, I think, revisited when you show me you can be trustworthy and you know, da da da, you know, having having specific things that you're the your partner that threw you out is looking for um, to have different so that you can work specifically on those with your therapist, with your sponsor, with your support structure. Um, but like Dr. Rob said, if you're doing this on your own and just trying not to push the boundaries, um, uh, you know, resentment, whatever, and why can't you get over it? And it's going to go really poorly. And, you know, Tammy, there's another piece of this question that I really want to cover, which is if you're an addict and you want to get rid of your uncertainty and your anxiety, you said um, you want this date so that you're not pushing your partner's boundaries, you can get rid of uncertainty, you reduce your anxiety, and you can focus on doing the right thing. Well, guess what? Focusing on doing the right things means staying out of that bedroom and not pressuring your spouse. And this is all you're putting on her or on the bedroom. Like, well, I'm afraid that if I don't get back in that bedroom, that I'm going to be this and that you're going to be this and that, or you're not, you know, it's not about the bedroom. It's about your attitude and your, where you're coming from. And if you want to have sex, maybe you can't, 
You know, I work with men, some of them along, I don't know if you knew this, Tammy, but some along the way who think that if they don't have sex, something bad's going to happen to their body. <laughs> like something's going to fall out or something. And it's like, no, you know, just like when we were teenagers, your body will take care of itself. And it's your mind that's tricking you. You know, we don't have to have sex. We have to eat. It's good to have sex. It's healthy to have sex, but we can survive without it. Look at all of the monks <laughs> who didn't have, well, we don't really know what they were doing, but they made nice manuscripts. They did. They, and they probably still do. So, okay. So the next question, how do I really know when the CSAT he started working with and the other things like podcasts and group calls my PA partner is doing are helping him with a third relapse recently in two years and will help me heal my distrust and betrayal trauma. I am very fresh in dealing with. I need signs to help me know he is actually working on this addiction. Thank you so much for all you do for us. Why don't you start with that one, Tammy? Because you've worked with a lot of CSATs and you've seen people just start therapy and all that. Um, but it's been two years. So what do you think? And a third relapse. So, so we talk about this all the time and I share with people that call in all the time, if what you're doing isn't enough, it needs to be more. So, so if he is just starting with a CSAT and it's been two years and relapses, you know, th then there's two years that he wasn't doing enough. So hopefully this is helpful, but you know, I hear that he's doing podcasts. I, I, I think you'll see changes like, you know, what is his accountability? You know, are, is he calling his sponsor? Is he, you know, does he have the software on his phone that's going to his CSAT? What is he doing that you should see noticeable differences from what he's been doing for the last two years? I, I, one more thing about this, Tammy. Um, I think that you are in some way answering your own question, because if you see this person Go, listening to podcasts, going to support groups, signing up for therapy. I mean, I'm sorry, it's his third relapse, but maybe he woke up. Maybe it's like, oh my God, I have a lot to lose and I better get to work. And, and that's great. And you need to protect yourself from, uh, you need a period of time without relapse, six months or something where you can feel safe and you're not going to feel safe until that happens. And if he hasn't joined the level one sex and porn addiction work groups, uh, there's another one starting June 2nd. They've been filling up um, uh, both April and May have overfilled. So, so the June 2nd one, um, is online on seekingintegrity.com. You can always email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. And I'm happy to point you in the right directions, but those are really good foundation pieces. And the guys that, uh, go through those, there's level one, two, and we've added a level three. We've got pieces to support, you know, ongoing, um, learning and, thinking about things in a different light. So I think that would be a beneficial foundation piece as well. So. Hey, Tammy. Yes. Do you ever take a breath? Yes. <laughs> yes. I know you are just on it. So on it. I did want to say something about that question though. Let me get back to it. Um, okay. Uh, la, la, la. Um, let me find it just a second. Um, oh. Okay. Well, um, I don't know that you're going to see this person change enormously in their attitude, but you're going to see them with a commitment to change. And you should not have to ask, have you been to this meeting? Have you been to this group? In fact, one of the things I recommend, and I would do this for you too, is I ask the addict to put a piece of paper on the refrigerator and say, or in the notepad or whatever, and say, this is what I'm doing Monday. This is what I'm doing Tuesday. And so the spouse doesn't even have to question it. You already know, oh, it's Tuesday. She's going to a meeting at four o'clock. Okay, great. And then you look over and they're at that online meeting. You know, that's really reassuring for you guys to see that we're keeping our commitments, especially to the recovery process. Yes. And I've thought if you have children, like you don't need to go sex addiction meeting, you can have your little codes for what you're doing and things like that too. So that it isn't, you know, um, your teenager goes, Oh, you know, so yeah, we would prefer that. Um, also um, the workbook series that Tammy's talking about, I wrote sex addiction 101. And then I wrote a workbook because I realized that a lot of the workbook kind of stuff out there is pretty therapy oriented and pretty complex. And I just wanted to get to what do you do? What do you need to do? You know, step one step, well, step's not the right word. Um, activity one, activity two, activity and with homework. And so that's what Tammy's talking about is a series where we took, you know, the first third of the book and the second third of the book and divided up all these exercises. And so we get, I don't know, we get 40 people or something. It's, I don't know how many folks come right now, 
But we, we limited it to 25, but they're not just videotapes. They're facilitated. So somebody is live. guiding them through that. So yes, because people have said, is this just a recorded? No, it's no. actually somebody, you know, Scott, Jason, or Jonah are leading those groups. And then we've got a couple healing from betrayal with Dr. Susie LeBrock, um, you know, teaching that one as well. So it's good stuff. So, okay. So the next question, you ready? I'm ready, always ready. Okay, let's the go. The trade partner here, I have and am experiencing trauma, PTSD from my husband's actions. I'm currently suffering from severe tinnitus. Can it be from the chronic stress? Tinnitus. I know my husband gets that word wrong too. And I didn't, I have it, so I know what it is. Oh, okay. Um, it's a really high pitch ringing corrected. in your- I yes. No, no, I don't mean to correct. It's just no, like no, one no. of those words that everybody- it's like tonight, it looks like tinnitus, but it's actually yeah. tinnitus. But okay. um, but I actually have this, so I kind of hate it. But um, it's a very high-pitched ringing in your ears that never quite goes away. And so even when there's no sounds at all, you're kind of hearing this, like a rush of wind or this noise. Um, I do know that tinnitus can, I know this for myself, it can be uh, escalate under stress. And any physical dysfunction can escalate under stress. I would also say to you, pardon me, um, let me see what this question has. Um, tinnitus is also uh, a medical issue. And so, you know, there are treatments for it. There are therapies for, I mean, medical therapies. Uh, it's not unusual for someone to have tinnitus because of the medication they're taking, you know, or a hormone that they're taking or, you know, whatever the, the pill or, you know, so many medications give you tinnitus, stress can give you tinnitus and uh, you have to be sort of vulnerable to it. Um, but was there a question about getting rid of it or I'm not sure I missed that part. So the question was, can it be from chronic stress? Yes. Okay. You could have answered that one in one group. <laughs> and then I would have never corrected you. I'm so sorry. Uh, so, so um, on the next one, can I think you can switch to open because I've got, um, I think I yes, up on that. So, so it says, how does a betrayed partner deal with their own sexual needs during this intense recovery period for the addict? I am still very upset and angry, but I have needs that he obviously was always taken care of. And I have been neglected for so long. It's difficult to navigate the right way to handle these physical and emotional needs. That's a great question. I think we kind of answered it earlier, but I'll give it to you in a different way. Um, we long for physical touch as human beings from the moment we're born till the end, we want hugs, you know? And so now that we're getting out of COVID and all that, I would, for one thing, I'd make appointments for massage, you know, to get, or Tammy does different kinds of body work. I think that would be really, really helpful. Uh, I'm going to get to the sex in a minute, but any kind of body related self-care, if you like yoga, you know, just really getting in touch with your body, stretching your body, have people, safe people touching your, I think that's wonderful stuff. And, you know, as I said before, um, they sell vibrators for a reason. And I'm a sexologist, I have no problem saying that. And, and there's no shame about masturbation, you know? Um, and you wanna keep your body, the more sex you have, the healthier your body is. And I, I really think that you should take care of yourself. Um, and I understand the longing and the desire to be with that person that you love. and it's not time yet. You have to, you're going to have to put yourself first, but by all means, go have sex by yourself. So somebody oh, added, baths, for, take, go ahead, I go was, ahead. yeah, no, I was thinking baths too, but Hot. somebody added for the tinnitus. I saw, said it right now. Tinnitus. So yes, ma'am. Belly breathing can help with uh, the ringing in the ears because it activates the rest and restore part of the brain. So that's a great tool i didn't so know belly that. beating is belly beating <laughs> belly what you belly breathing belly is like breathing um, yeah it's so like it's meditation it's deep rhythmic breathe, breathing you know pushing the thoughts out. and by the way for those of you who want to meditate those of you who want to do belly breathe any of this kind of stuff there are endless youtubes there are endless apps i mean we live in an age of technology tammy i don't know about you but so many people write and i god love them they say you know, how do I find this or how do I figure that out? And I just Google. go on Google and I figure it out and then I answer the question. So we forget sometimes that even the most challenging things are up there. Um, and by the way, if I were someone who wasn't having sex with my partner, I would type in, haven't had sex, uh, sexual self-care. You know, no one's going to look, no one's seeing, no one's looking at you and see what other ideas, like Tammy said, take a hot bath with oil. And it's not sex, but it's nurturing and it's taking care of yourself, music, all of it, all the sensual experiences. 
Okay, so the next question, what do you think about the use of psychedelics under the right environment to help with addiction? I know therapy and other work is more important, but could it be useful to help with under some circumstances? So there only is one psychedelic that is current, currently legal, legal for physicians to use in order to deal with mental health issues. And it's not even really a psychedelic, it's more of a uh, anesthetic and that's ketamine. Ketamine is something that, that people do get injected and they go to doctors and it is it gives them a sort of psychedelic experience and i think and i know i've seen the research that for depression it's very very helpful for other issues it can blow you out of the water um if you're bipolar it might make you manic if you're in, in other words it will ketamine is activating it takes people who are depressed and feel and it kind of it's dissociative tammy you dissociate you know all the pressure and stress kind of goes away and you're kind of got a, a fresh emotional start but if you're an addict or if you're an intensity seeker it's going to reduce your ability to calm and refocus and escalate your 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 uh, impulsivity there is no research at all that ketamine is useful for addiction at all. As to the other psychedelics, I was just reading a great article about this, mescaline, LSD, they are being used in trials. Um, oh, uh, what's the big one? Uh, we used to call it ecstasy, MDMA. Um, for example, that particular drug produces sort of a, it's called the love drug. It makes people just feel love and wonderful. It's, you know, brain chemistry. They're using that for people who have Asperger's and have difficulty connecting and having empathy to see if this drug can allow them to feel more connected to people. So um, they are using psychedelics and it's a whole new exciting field of, of, of psychotherapy, or rather uh, psychiatry, but you're not gonna get into one for addiction because there isn't any. And the only one that's legal is ketamine. Um, which I don't think is suited for this. So the answer is no. <laughs> and my short answer is, it feels like I'm looking for the easier, softer way. I don't want to do the, like, just give me a drug to take care of things. So, so I invite you to do the journey. It's worth it. So, okay. What's your opinion when the betrayed spouse doesn't accept sex addiction as a real addiction problem? As the essay, how, oops, sorry. Um, as an essay, how am I supposed to make progress when my spouse doesn't believe in this form of addiction? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by progress because your progress is not dependent on your spouse on any level. And a lot of the guys I have to say that come into treatment program into the treatment program are saying, I'm here to save my marriage. I'm here to make sure I don't lose my partner. I'm here to save my job. And they realize, I think if they, if we're able to put the right lens on that over time, they're there for themselves. And it doesn't really matter whether your partner believes in it or not, you, you're on a path. And that may not be one your partner relates to or understands. You can just say that, you know, I'm sorry that this isn't a path that you think is useful. I know you probably think I'm a bad person, but I need some kind of path. <laughs> I need some kind of direction. I need some kind of structure to heal and this is a structure and i'm going to go for it you don't have to call it sex addiction the official diagnosis by the way all over the world except the united states and canada is compulsive sexual behavior disorder it's actually a mental health disorder csb compulsive sexual yeah csbd so she doesn't have to believe in sex addiction but you can show her you can look up compulsive sexual behavior disorder and you will find the definition with criteria Let's say, you know, if you do five out of these six things and it goes, so it isn't like, does this exist? Um, it, we have that thought and belief in our culture because our particular manual in, in Canada and the United States has not put it in yet. But every other country in the world has a CSBD diagnosis. I, you know, um, what um, if you're looking at alcohol and drugs and you look in the formal guides and all that, they call it substance use disorder. So I've never seen someone say to their spouse or at a 12 step meeting, you know, I have a substance use disorder. It, it, you know, we use the colloquial, right? So I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, but CSBD and sex addiction, they're really synonyms. It's just one is a formal diagnosis and one is a colloquial way of saying it. So you can educate her. And at the end of the day, if there's compulsive behavior that's keeping us not in healthy attachments to someone else, it's a problem. And how do we fix it? There are uh, day by day, there are methods we can use. And uh, to me, thank goodness I had a label because otherwise I was just nuts, which right. don't even go there. 
<laughs> no, but I was going to say, Tammy, to your point that the people who want to take away this, you know, sex addiction doesn't exist. Don't they realize that so many of us have our hopes pinned on this is a process I think that works and I'm going to pursue it because it's helped other people. So to demand and 12 step programs and all that support, you can have a lifetime, a therapist you get as long as you can pay for us. So to have a lifetime and a lifeline of support in a situation where people have the same problem, boy, are you lucky uh, to have that, whether your wife believes in it or not. Yeah. And to tool, I didn't have the tools to use and the people in the 12 step taught me. So, so recovery gave me the tools to use to live life in a in a healthy way. And I'm so, so grateful. So, okay. Next question. My essay partner of eight years has been in recovery since D-Day in January. He's, I have a whole thought about that. He's in weekly therapy and SA meetings. I have struggled with boundaries because previously he was able to convince me that my needs weren't met because of something I was doing. As I build courage in being able to stick to my guns and what I need to feel safe, he continues to push back. Specific boundaries are no phones in the bathroom. Let me know where you're going when you are with and no one uh, no one on one time with female coworkers. Each time he says he is not doing anything wrong, it is not even tempted to he, um, is not even tempted to and feels hurt that I am triggered by these things. Oh, poor I know, baby. I know. Are these I got reasonable to have sex boundaries? With them. I got to have sex with 500 people during our marriage and cheat on you, but I feel badly when you say mean things to me. I, just think about that. It doesn't really add up. Go ahead, Tammy. Why don't you start and I'll, I'll Well, and it up. says, why does he keep attempting to convince me that they aren't necessary? Because he doesn't want to stop. That's, right. you know, and so I'm going to go back to the, I tripped over the first sentence because it was like, you know, he's been in recovery yeah. since January D-Day. He's not in recovery. He may have some form of abstinence, but if he's, if he's still in the bathroom with his phone, if he's still talking to coworkers, you know, female coworkers, he's keeping that dopamine going. So, so to me, he's like, I would be skeptical that he is and I see this as abstinence and then you get some sobriety and then the recovery is you see changes. He's not, and I'm going to use the word whining about, I feel hurt. I feel bad. You're, you're, you are making me feel bad, even though my partner of eight years has been betraying me. And now he feels bad because I want his phone not to go in the bathroom with him. I mean, please. I, I wrote in the chat, addicts lie. You know, we don't always tell the truth. And what I really don't like about your story is, of course, you get to ask. In fact, you shouldn't even have to ask. This person should be coming to you and saying, let me tell you how this week went. And let me tell you what I'm dealing with. And by the way, you'll notice I didn't do this. I didn't. It's about respecting you and respect. You shouldn't feel pushed back because you're just trying to take care of yourself. And, you know, this whole evening has been, I think, a discussion about as a partner, do I have a right having been harmed and lied to and betrayed and all of that, do I have a right to say no on a variety of ways? And do I have a right to, you know, yes, you have a right. You, you're no longer equal as a couple. This person is one down. They need to do things to reassure you and make you feel better and work on themselves or else um, you're never going to be equals back in this relationship. So they have to work their way back to trust. Um, and I hear a lot of things, a lot of pushing back, a lot of don't ask me that. And why are you bothering me? And of course, I'm doing that. And by the way, person recovery never does that. I would say to you, you know, I completely understand why you would ask me. And I understand why you're worried. And another person that should read out of the doghouse who doesn't have a clue how to support his spouse is this guy. Hey, Tammy, I hate to say it because we were short on time, but we're out of time. I know I wanted you to. It's OK. There's there's. Um... It, it is okay, but. Well, answer the question. There's 64 people in here. Let's get it out. Okay. Get so there's, out. there's two more. We've been, I recently found out that my former six years ago acting out partner was arrested for sex trafficking for the life of me. I can't stop Googling and looking up the status of this criminal court case. It's baffling me why I invest energy in this person. Any insights? I'm a female a sex and love addict two and a half years in recovery. Well, there's a lot of questions there. Um, let me say this in a, in a, in a healthy way. Um, I don't know if you're in a current relationship or not. I really would guess not, but um, there's nothing wrong with longing for the love we had with someone else, even if there's been abuse and problems. 
I have family members who've been very abusive and very awful to me, but there are things I really love about them and I have them in my life to a certain degree. So um, I, I do think that this requires accountability in terms of your love addiction program. You know, you need someone to call and say, hey, I feel like looking him up. What do you think? Because you're having a feeling that you have not identified when you feel like doing that. And you're being impulsive. If you're saying, I don't want to be doing that. And in the moment you're doing it, you're being impulsive. And the way we deal with impulsivity is by being accountable. I'm not just going to do this. I'm going to call someone and make sure it's okay. So one thing I would allow yourself to validate that you have love and that you still have love for this person and you were connected to them because there's nothing wrong with that. And then I would look at the compulsive part and ask for help. Yes. I'm sending, I'm, no, it's all good. No, I, that was, I wanted you to answer that one because you would do a better job. So, so, and I typed in answer to the other one. And so we have finished. We and got you guys keep done. saying thank you to us. I want to say thank you to you. Every question reminds me of why I'm here. Every issue that comes up is another thought for how I can teach or write or do the work. So I'm grateful to you, every one of you, for allowing us into your lives to give us an opportunity to think more clearly about. And don't you think you re reinforce our healing? Every time you tell us what you're struggling is another reason why I want to work on myself so I don't hurt people like that. So thank you for being here. Me too. You too, Tammy. Thank you. Okay. But, You're an island in the reality in an ocean of diarrhea. Oh, I'll, I like I, that. it's dinner, I like it's dinner that. time. I'm going to let eat. that one go. All right. Bye. No, I mean, I don't want to think about it. see you later. Oh, I know. Bye.